Hello and welcome to the Dinosaur for week 27. Another seven curious, interesting things I saw last week. So let's crack on. Uh, the first one uh, is not some great news from Google or specifically Google's algorithm. So uh, this was, uh, apparently this has been going on for a fair few years. Uh, apparently it's appeared in 2016, I think. It's now 2022, it's still going on. So uh, what is this? Uh, this is if you search for a specific term, which is desk ornament in Google images. So if you search for it in Google and then click on the images tab, uh, lo and behold, you see a huge amount of Nazi paraphernalia. So uh, that is obviously not great. Um, so um, why is this happening? Uh, well, it's obviously the algorithm that is uh, being gamed. Um, so a lot of the descriptions use, uh, for instance, desk ornament, not desktop ornament. So, and some of the pages use something like 130 something uh, mentions of desk ornament in their description. So clearly somebody's uh, gaming the SEO of this. And then of course, you, you know, as soon as somebody talks about this, people then do it like I have done here as you can see on the screen um, and then you'll go is this really a thing and then you'll click on one of them and that therefore verifies to the algorithm that it did the right thing so it'll do it again so um, obviously this has been going on or I tried this out a week ago and it's still doing it now so it still hasn't been fixed um, surely there's a an if this then that somewhere somewhere at Google that can be deployed about this but uh, there you go um, so still issues uh, with the Google SEO apparently this happens with DuckDuckGo as well so it's not just Google it's happening all over the place algorithms um, this is a bit of a change of uh, <laughs> change of uh, scenario, really, for one of these. So this is uh, magic tricks. Uh, I love a good magic trick uh, and technology. What what better combination? So. Uh, what this is, this is actually a developer called uh, Paul Nettle, um, and I can only applaud this. So what it is, it's using a Raspberry Pi, uh, you can see on there a little camera with an infrared camera on it, um, and a pack of cards with each card having an individual barcode across it. Um, now if you then, obviously that's obvious what's going on there, you can tell whether each card is there or not there, um, but obviously you can't really play cards like that or do a trick because people know what's going on. Uh, so then what he did is he uh, created it with uh, infrared ink, uh, so you could only you see the, the barcodes using an infrared camera, uh, which is what you're seeing on the Raspberry Pi. So that then uploaded it to a server, and therefore you can have your phone, which was accessing the camera, on the server, uh, and then you could see, and it would tell you which cards are available. So if somebody said, uh, I'd like to take one card out of the pack, it would then be able to highlight which one is there, because it would not spot the barcode. Um, why? Don't really know. Uh, it might make some cards uh, tricks a little bit more funky in the future, um, but I just thought that was really, really interesting use of A, barcodes, and B, technology, and C, magic. There you go. Um, this is, um, I've recently visited Toronto, and I've walked past this very, very, very place. So this is down by the quayside. Uh, and this is an interesting report uh, about smart cities. Now these are all the rage uh, and have been probably for 10 years or so, smart cities where data is everywhere. Um, you can throw out your rubbish or your garbage and it would know exactly how much and all that sort of stuff. Um, and basically this has then failed in Toronto um, in as much as people just, people just didn't want it. Um, so this utopian, uh, everybody's gonna be living in some sort of uh, hyper-connected, data-regulated, um, high-rise building. Um, is really well as as the quote in the article was I thought was quite eloquent you know wind and rain and birds and bees rather than data so you know this is kind of the utopia of having uh, smart everything uh, everybody's sort of now going actually do you know what we've seen the harm that data can do and um, we've seen also seen the harm that tracking can do uh, and therefore do you know what I think I'd rather just live in my home without being tracked by any data. So this whole kind of movement towards smart cities um, has a very sort of public, um, let's just say sort of totem really that everybody can then refer to now. So um, yeah, so that was the sidewalk thing. I think it was originally that was Google uh, that were going to um, do something about that. So um, yeah, there you go. Uh, maybe the, uh, the archetypal failing of smart cities, um, really interesting article, go and read it. Um, GitHub, if you don't know what GitHub is, it's where coders um, put their, up, upload their code and also share their code with other people. If you're looking for some code and you don't know how to do something, it's a great place to go and find some code because lots of people share their code. Um, if you are something like a an open source developer and you want other people to uh, freely access your code, it's a great place to put it. Now, um, obviously now what's happening is, this is owned by Microsoft, by the way, underneath all of the, or, or underneath the brands. Um, now, what Microsoft are doing, they've got this, um, they've got this I guess it's a platform or um, a product uh, which is called um, Copilot. And what Copilot does is will auto finish the code for you. Now that's a closed system, so they're not actually publishing how it does this, but what it really does is it takes all the code that's been uploaded onto GitHub, it knows 
pretty much every function that's ever been written because it's seen it a bunch of times and therefore it allows it to regurgitate the, probably the best um, version of the function that you're about to write so it can predict what you're about to write. Now, now clearly this is all in a closed system, they're not, they're not giving you the software to do that. Um, so um, the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy uh, has basically said look, look, anybody who's doing open source software should probably quit Git um, because this is this is kind of using all of your hard work and it's it's using it for commercial gains. Uh, apparently underneath it as well, um, GitHub is also taking on commercial um, projects as well. So it's using open source software for commercial gain, which is against yeah, all the principles of open source software. So there you go, I uh, just thought it was interesting. I uh, know what are the moral implications of using other people's free code for commercial gains. There you go. Um, this was a really uh, interesting one that was sent to me, uh, I think, uh, what was it, Tuesday I think it was this week, so I've had a, a bunch of time to try and figure out how this actually works, so thank you Matt. Um, so this one is about controlling two limbs using um, a brain-computer interface, or a BCI. Um, now um, it's talking about degrees of freedom, so without going too far into it, a degree of freedom is kind of up, down, left, right, rotation, pitch, yaw, all those sorts of things, so these are degrees of freedom. Um, that's quite a lot for your brain to take on. Now, you can barely think of up, down, left, right um, using a brain control interface, uh, let alone control two limbs doing that as well. So how does this work? Well, it actually uses essentially an algorithm or a robot that is autonomous that knows pretty much how to do the task. Um, if it is, for instance, feed me, then uh, it will know, broadly speaking, it's got to stab the thing on the, on the plate and it's got to move it towards your mouth and then release it and put it back down and repeat. However, it might not get that exactly right because your mouth is moving and all that sort of stuff. And that's where you, essentially the human, uh, do the, the light trimming of the actual algorithm itself. So you work in teamwork or symbiosis with the machine and that's how it works. So um, yeah, so I thought this was really interesting and that you know, that's clearly going to be the future which is there is some sort of autonomous uh, or robotic system that works in partnership with you to move your limbs or move your legs or whatever it might need to be. Now clearly this doesn't have to be uh, for people who have some sort of disability or quadriplegic or you know spinal um, sever somewhere. Um, this could also be for military use or whatever it is or industrial use as well. So um, this does currently need um, little chips embedded in the brain to pick up on those um, um, signals. But other than that, <laughs> that, might, that might be in your job interview. Uh, are you okay to have a chip implanted in your brain? Um, now, I reported uh, last week uh, on the Supreme Court in the US, obviously um, a, a ban or a severely restricting uh, access to uh, abortion in the US. Uh, and obviously, you know, there was much written about that. Um, now, this is interesting that a lot of tech has now started to get behind this uh, in as much as they know that the danger that it, the, the data that people have uh, might put them uh, into sort of, you know, fear of uh, criminal um, repercussions, etc, etc. So, um, so what Google have announced is uh, actually quite, quite, quite um, wide reaching. It's going to be in the next couple of weeks. Um, it will roll out. Um, but if you go to a medical facility, uh, maybe you've gone to counselling, domestic violence, abortion clinics, fertility centres, addiction treatments, uh, weight loss clinics, or you've had cosmetic surgery, that could be used by people who may be able to hack that or um, maybe subpoena it in a, in a quote-unquote legal way that might be used against you. So uh, what they're now saying is they will, as a matter of course, if you want it, obviously you can turn it on. Um, so if you have this feature turned on, then if you go anywhere near these um, areas, it will delete the data um, either immediately afterwards or you know shortly thereafter. So I um, thought that was a really interesting, um, not only a gesture, but a feature. So uh, hopefully we'll see more of this. Um, and again, you know, to my previous thing about smart cities, you know, this data is accumulating about you and people are starting to see that actually this might have some sort of um, malicious intent if used badly. Um, there you go. And finally, um, again, slightly on the same same thing, apparently deep fakes are going for interviews. Uh, now these are for remote jobs, so if you have a, especially a remote coder job for instance, um, so what people are doing, and it is suspected, uh, um, North Korea is suspected of, of being behind this, however, um, there's not a huge amount of information really behind this. This is, as you might know, um, so this is on the FBI's site, um, so they are warning people about this. Um, now, what's going on here is people are turning up, or people are, um, I guess, yeah, turning up really, because it's be a video interview, um, using a fake video, which is real-time 
hopefully synced to a spoofed voice and ideally what they've done is they've already done some digging on the candidate as well so they're turning up with a, a person who maybe has a LinkedIn profile that they've taken the details off that person they've then uh, probably used a, a photo of them which is maybe also on LinkedIn or some, something similar uh, they've recreated the persona and therefore they do a an interview now it's unclear exactly why they're doing this uh, it might be just to get the paycheck at the end of the day um, which is a long way around doing it for you know a couple of thousand quid maybe um, but it might also be as soon as this person is then quote unquote hired then they might be given access to internal systems and all that sort of stuff and security pass that you wouldn't normally get so um, what a weird way of doing it but there you go so if you are uh, hiring especially coders or tech people um, for remote jobs then you might just want to see um, whether the actual the face syncs up to the um, the um, uh, the voice. Apparently the way that uh, certain ones of these have been caught, which I thought was really interesting, is that uh, when they heard the person sneeze or cough, then the video didn't actually, the video of their face didn't actually sneeze or cough because it didn't know what to do with it. So um, watch out for sneezes or coughs in interviews. There you go. Um, hopefully that was interesting. Hopefully it was useful. Uh, if it did, uh, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, um, and also uh, maybe comment underneath and share it with somebody interesting. It really does help. So thank you for that. I'll see you next week.